Hello everyone. Um, now that we've done all that fun, exciting stuff, uh, we're all gonna have to listen to some guy read for 15 minutes. <laughs> Super stoked. Um, so a little bit about me. I mostly write plays, mostly write sketches, but here is a little short story I uh, wrote. Um, it's about that feeling about uh, if you've ever kind of had this like weird little thing that you've always done to your like with just yourself and no one else knows. And then one day you open up Twitter and someone's like, does anyone else do this really specific thing and it has like a hundred thousand upvotes and you're like, fuck, oh, I thought that was mine. Like I thought that was just mine and it's not. Um, and it's about that feeling of not being special. Um, okay. It was at the exact moment that Darren from accounting began to describe his unique morning routine in a way that so perfectly mirrored my own that I feel the very last essence of myself ripped from my husk and released into the ether. Keeping a glass of water by your nightstand so that you can pour a little bit into your eyes when you wake up shouldn't be something that anyone does. By morning, the water would be warm and have that confusing ring of bubbles in it to give that sensation that maybe it isn't safe for consumption, let alone pouring into your eyes. Not only that, the water would run off your face and pool onto your pillow sheet, which if you didn't wash regularly, which I didn't, uh, would surely lead to some kind of bacterial problem. There was no reason any person would not immediately rule out an idea so ridiculous out of their head. But it was something I did. I always struggled with sleep, falling into and waking up from. I tried every sensible thing to do first, of course, but none of it worked. And that did, so I kept doing it. And while I thought it was something embarrassing and immature, I at least was able to take solace in the fact that this bizarre and unreasonable act was unabashedly me. Yet there Darren from accounting sat across the lunch table, sharing his story of the totally crazy thing he does and taking away my last bit of autonomy. He jokes to a room full of coworkers that I have never once cared for the opinion of until today, and his story lands. They eat it up. They think him a pioneer for doing something so exclusive to his own individual identity. I should have been happy that the routine I had carried with such shame was being so positively received, but instead that shame migrated to the feeling that if anyone found out now, they would think me a pale copycat, a commonality slipping into banality. I wanted to tell Darren from accounting that he was a fool for doing what he did. I wanted to tell him that bacteria built up in his pillowcase or in his water glasses, and that one day it might blind him. I wanted to steal this action back from myself to be isolated, not alone, only in the sense that being separated from the crowd might actually allow me to be seen. But instead, I sit, and I smile, and I thank the universe that at least it had not been Jason from advertising. <laughs> when I get home that night, I take my shoes off by the door as everyone else does, slump down into whatever chair or couch was nearest as everyone else does, and bury my face into my hands until I can find the strength to get up again, as I hope everyone else does. I make the same meal as I always do when I need to go grocery shopping, plain pasta and an end piece of bread. If it was a particularly good day, I eat both end pieces. Today I have just the one. I turn on the TV and watch whatever show everyone is talking about. Today is a show about people who work in an office. On this episode, the coworker whose only discernible trait is that he's lazy is made fun of for packing a sandwich for lunch made of two end pieces of bread. What? he exclaims. I forgot to go grocery shopping. He asks if anyone wants to trade lunches and can laughter plays as the sarcastic coworker rolls his eyes into the camera. There should be something unifying in seeing an aspect of myself portrayed on the screen, that even in isolation I can find the comfort in the representation of a shared experience. Yet I only feel my character stripped away into caricature. I am not a person. I am an amalgam of preconceived ideas that all fall into neatly organized categories for consumption. A prepared dish, a recipe down to every last heartbreaker hobby. I read that in a tweet once. <laughs> when I go to bed, I do not bring a glass of water. That glass of water is gone. It was pried from my hands and left resting atop the nightstand of another man. <laughs> I consider pouring a glass of orange juice instead as if I could find my individuality on a technicality. But it only takes one Google search to find that a five-year-old YouTube tutorial beat me to it. 
I look through my fridge for anything else to use, but after stumbling on an internet article of the top 20 things to pour into your eyes to wake up in the morning, I give up hope. I thought about even pouring hydrogen peroxide and blinding myself, but even then I found out about this small spiritual group in the mountains that you've never heard of. Uh, they do it to form a closer bond to their other senses. Instead, I lay in bed, taking refuge in the, from the darkness under the dull pool of light of my phone and read a forum thread about navigating dissatisfaction in life. The page notifies me, 12 other people are reading this thread right now. <laughs> I wake up in the morning and I'm already late for work. My hand reached for water that wasn't there and without it I had fallen back asleep. The shock of being late doesn't add any urgency to getting ready. If anything, I fall into a leisurely acceptance. I make toast out of my final end piece of bread and finish off my carton of orange juice that I am pleased I did not waste on my eyes. There's traffic on the freeway. Everyone else is late too. Uh, I read a report that someone tried to copy the spiritual practices of that mountain village, blinding themselves, and it caused a 10-car pileup because their other senses had not yet gotten strong enough to drive. <laughs> the person in the car to the right of me gives a shocked expression that's supposed to say, can you believe this? I give him a shrug that translates approximately to, what are you going to do? He asks, he shakes his head in a way that either meant, this is ridiculous, or I am not sure how much more of this I can take. <laughs> My hand gesturing is rusty. When the traffic moves and the two lanes offset, I repeat the conversation to a new car to the right of me. And again, and again, performing the same hollow responsibility of human connection. By the time I make it to my exit, I'm already three hours late for work. The thought crosses my mind of having to explain to everyone why I was late. I imagine telling them I overslept and Darren from accounting would say, then I guess you should have tried throwing some water in your eyes and everyone laughs. The roar of their ridicule digs into my skull to the point that it is deafening. When it gets to my turn to take the exit, I turn off my blinker and I keep driving forward. I drive for hours, unsure of where to go. I think about driving to the nearby lake and skipping stones, but when I get there, the parking lot is full. After so long, the fuel light comes on and I am forced to pull into a gas station. My stomach is twisted in a knot from only having known one piece of toast this morning, so I go inside to grab something to eat. I give the cashier a polite nod and start circling the aisles. I am the only person in the store and I can feel her spotlight eyes trace my every move as I sift the disheveled shelves for the taste of something heavily processed. Today is a day I deserve to treat my body poorly. I decide it will come in the form of my favorite flavor of chips, fried pickle and paprika. When I get to the brand I like, I begin to rummage through the other lesser flavors, the sour creams, the barbecues, and every type of cheese, looking for the one flavor that the years had built an emotional co connection to. Sold out. What? I ask. Sold out, the cashier says. Popular flavor. Instead, I search for an item that is stocked full on the shelf. I find a box of off-brand plum-flavored jerky nearly six months past expiration. I buy three and another carton of orange juice. Oh, the cashier says when I lay everything out on the counter. Haven't seen someone buy this before, have you? I say, wearing a thin veil of confidence. <laughs> Son, she says, leaning closer until her breath bathes me in cigarette smoke. I've worked here for 20 years. I've seen everything. <laughs> Out of the corner of my eye, I catch the glint of a pair of glitter-drenched short shorts hanging in the small bin marked clearance behind her. No one has ever bought those shorts before, have they? I ask. She doesn't respond, her old bones creaking back upright. After the transaction, I take the bathroom key and I change into the shorts. The sound of cheap polyester sliding against faux leather greets me as I fall back into the seat of my car. What I didn't know before I bought them is that the glitter spelled out the words hands off on the backside. <laughs> I also didn't know they'd be a size too small and would ride up on my crotch while driving. After so long, it feels as if my legs are going numb and I have to pull over somewhere. I search up best bars in the city, sort it by lowest rating to highest, and choose the first. When I get to the bar, I'm lucky to even find a seat. Through the vast sea of people, I catch the fickle attention of the bartender who makes his way to me and gives me a nod that tells me he's awaiting my order. I ask him to surprise me and I drink a beer that tastes the same as any other beer. 
No shorts, I hear behind me. I turn around, fully prepared to be mocked in my fashion choices, hoping for it even, only to see a man wearing a stupid grin and a pair of tight pink short shorts. Apparently the show that everyone was talking about today, a different show than everyone was talking about yesterday, had a fan favorite character that wore these shorts. The man told me he was surprised I could even find a pair with how fast they were flying off the shelves. He tells me we have to get a picture together, so I pose for one normal photo and one funny one, and that is the last I see of him. After my fourth surprise me beer, I am unsure if the bartender has given me the same beer each time, or if I had not paid him close enough attention to the minute differences in flavor. By the time I finish it, everyone else has left the bar. As the bartender cleans behind the counter, he notices my empty uh, stare that has burrowed miles deep into the bottom of my glass. Tough day? Yeah. You know you aren't the first to feel that way. I want to cry. I want to scream and kick and knock over every table. I want to be the first person wearing a pair of pink hands-off short shorts to be arrested for destruction of private property in the worst bar in the city. I want everyone to see me on the 11 o'clock news and think, that is a real person. That is a distinct, singular being performing an extraordinary action. They exist, but I don't. <laughs> Do you ever worry that you will go through this life without doing anything truly unique? I ask him. The bartender mulls over the question for a moment as he wipes the inside of a mug. Isn't everything unique? But if everything is unique, then nothing is unique. He places the dried mug on a counter. Which world would you rather live in? I don't have an answer. The bartender sighs. Look, he says, if you want to do something no one else has ever done before, there's this mountain, not far from here. Very dangerous climb, very few have done it. And I imagine no one has done it four beers deep in the middle of the night wearing those shorts you wear. But I'm not responsible for whatever you get yourself into. I thank him, and before I head out the door, he tells me to wait. And from behind the counter, he pulls out a sombrero and hands it to me. For good measure, he says. <laughs> I'm too drunk to drive, so I put my carton of orange juice and a half-eaten plum jerky into my bag and begin stumbling towards the mountain. As I walk there, I put my shorts on backwards and scrape off some of the glitter so that the pants of the pants so that all that remains is the word ha. The mountain isn't too hard to climb or too drunk to notice. It takes a few hours and many short breaks, but I can see I'm almost at the top. By this point, my legs start to get out under my weight and from the reduced circulation from the shorts, but I keep going. My stomach is revolting. The expired jerky and the orange juice and the beer are pushing to get out of any hole in my body, but I keep going. The wind gets stronger towards the top. I clench onto my sombrero, push through it all, and I keep going. As I make the climb, I realize this is the most I have ever worked towards something in my entire life. <laughs> A more insidious thought follows, its sharp pang in my chest, reminding me of how easy of a bar it was to pass. It is nearly daybreak when I reach the summit. The burgeoning sun peeks out over the horizon, painting a gentle auburn across the landscape. I stand at the top and try to take in the solitary and remarkable moment. If it were not for the person wearing backwards pink short shorts and a sombrero already standing there before me. <laughs> He turns towards me, and I see that he too has scraped off the glitter to only read ha, and is holding a grocery bag that I can only guess is filled with orange juice and expired plum jerky sticks. No, he deflates in front of me. No, no, no. Does your bag have orange juice and plum jerky sticks, I say? Expired? Yeah. He sits on the ground, devoid of emotion. I sit with him. Together we watch the sunrise in silence. Do you think, he says after a while, that anyone has done everything we've done and then jumped off? Probably not, I say, but I don't want to. Me either, he says. I guess we walk down now. I guess so. I don't know if it was the speed or the manner in which I stand up, 
But in an instant, I feel the expired plum jerky finally enacting its revenge upon me. As quickly as I rise to my feet, I collapse back down onto my knees and begin to vomit. The acidic tastes of orange, plum, and one to four different beers rush through my mouth once again and onto the summit of the most insurmountable climb in the city. No, don't, he gags. If you puke, I'll puke. And like clockwork, he falls to his knees and vomits beside me, the two of us under the early flush of morning, emptying our guts atop the entire world. I guess I can't have that to myself either, I joke. I guess not, he laughs. We rest our broken bodies atop the peak's edge without exchanging a single word, but we didn't need to. All that needed to be said existed in the space around us. We let ourselves linger in it, feeling the cool breeze against our skin that carries the aroma of pine and fresh vial. Our sombreros provide a checkered shade from the rising sun as we wash down the rawness of our throats with the last of warm orange juice. The glitter from our shorts take flight in the breeze, enacting a dance for our eyes only. Their performance ends almost as soon as it begins, their glisten disappearing in the morning air. In the symphony of this fleeting instant, we find what had been missing living within the moment shared between us now. Forever ours and only ours, at least for this moment. In this piece, I find the strength to speak again. I turn in his direction and against the burning pastels of a new day, I see him. Do you ever have trouble waking up? Sometimes, he says, looking back at me. I smile. Me too.